Hi, the US Federal Reserve just raised their interest rates by 25 basis points to make it 5 to 5.25%. And for simplicity's sake, let's just call it 5.25%. And this rate is as high as it was back then in 2007, right before the global financial crisis, where we saw Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, two of the largest banks in the US, went bust. I know. So in this video, I will give you a quick update on the US economy's economic health and also share with you what's next in store for you and what I'm doing next. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. At a very high level, you need to know that earlier this year, the US have accumulated $31.4 trillion of debt, which means it has now crossed the debt ceiling, which is the level at which their Congress or their lawmakers allow the government to borrow money in order to fund the country's operations. And if they can't borrow any more money, it would also mean the US might default on their bond interest payments, etc. And let's just say, it will be a catastrophic disaster. And this sounds bad, of course, but actually it's nothing new because the US national debt has crossed the ceiling countless amount of times in the past, 78 times since 1960 to be exact, and most recently in 2021. And Congress has always raised the ceiling without much issue. But this time, it's slightly different because Congress is still in deadlock on raising the debt ceiling due to political reasons. And they are quickly running out of time because the next bond payment is on the 1st of June and if the debt ceiling is not raised by then, the US will then default on their payment. And it's a developing story and there's nothing we can do for now except monitor it closely. But rest assured, I will keep you all updated on all of the news so do subscribe if you don't want to miss any of it. Now let's take a quick look at how the various industries in the US are doing in this high interest rates environment. The real estate industry have seen a continuous decline of the number of new and existing homes sold because when interest rates are high, where it has hit the 7% mark few months ago, people will think twice about committing to a huge debt. And it's just the way it is. But in recent months, we actually seen an increase in existing home buyers in the US because people are expecting the Fed or the Federal Reserve to stop raising rates beyond the 5.25% mark. And on the other side, in the tech industry, they are not any better either because they were at the forefront of growth back in 2020 and also 2021. And rightfully so, they are now also the first ones to get hit by the economic headwinds in the form of higher interest rates because tech companies or growth companies in general rely heavily on their future cash flow to justify their valuation premium, which traditionally is the highest in comparison to all other industries. So higher rates mean lower future cash flow which means their valuation and stock prices have to be adjusted down as well. And we have seen massive, massive layoffs from tech companies in an attempt to reduce their operational expenses, which are their costs, which will then help with maintaining their earnings and cash flow, which is, again, key to their valuation. And even companies like Tesla are forced to cut the prices of their vehicle again and again and again in order to stimulate the demand and maintain their bottom line. And that's just one example out of the hundreds of companies struggling to do the same too. And lastly, the banking sector, which I'm sure most of you are familiar about it, at least recently. We had a series of regional banks went bust due to poor risk management and they happened to get caught off guard by the rising interest rates such as the Silicon Valley Bank, Silvergate Bank, Signature Bank and most recently First Republic Bank which has seen bought out by JP Morgan Chase. And this impact wasn't just limited to the US because it has also sent shockwave to the global banking sectors as well. So the bank failures on top of the high rates collectively has caused the tightening of credit where people and businesses no longer have access to easy and cheap money and funding, which subsequently discouraged business investments and also consumer spendings and borrowings in the form of house mortgage and also car loans. And to make it worse, consumers have started to lose trust in the banking system and started withdrawing en masse, which just adds salt to the wound. Now, let's take a look at the main economic indicator for the US. The US GDP for the first quarter came in at plus 1.1%, far below the analyst estimates of 
2.0%, mainly due to three factors. One, business inventory drawdown, which means businesses are reducing their ready stock and inventory because they are expecting lower demand in the future. And number two, reducing business equipment purchases, which means businesses are being defensive and want to preserve their cash. And number three, reducing residential housing investment, which just means less property buyer and investors, mainly due to the high interest rates like I've just mentioned. But there is one saving grace in the quarter where we saw the personal consumption expenditure or consumer spending in layman's term ballooning from plus 1% in the prior quarter to now 3.7%. That's a huge jump and it shows that consumers are still spending money and shows no sign of slowing down yet. Maybe they have enough cash accumulated or it's just revenge spending post-pandemic. And yes, GDP dropping from 3.2% to 2.6% to 1.1% in Q1 means we have a continuing decline in economic activity. And although this is not recession yet, we are just one step closer towards it. Because remember, recession or technical recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Now, PCE index increased a lot, but what about core PCE, which excludes food and energy components? It's important because when you strip off those volatile components, which can be affected by weather, geopolitical events, etc, etc, which are really short term in nature, you will then get the accurate representation of the actual inflation number. And that's why core PCE is the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge. That number came in at plus 4.6% year over year for the month of March 2023, which is higher than the forecasted plus 4.5%. And despite it being lower than the previous months, it is still, in my opinion, not good enough because at 4.5% after a series of rate hikes, it just means inflation is still persistent and shows no sign of slowing down. And that was why the Fed went ahead and hiked the rates by 25 bips again in May. So what's next? We have seen smaller banks failing, falling GDP, stubborn inflation, slowing down business spending, reduction in property investments, and corporates laying off left and right in order to maintain their bottom line and earnings. What else does the stock market have in store for us before the so-called full-blown recession hits us in the face? Well, the way I see it, based on my educated guess at best, here's how I think this will develop. Firstly, more regional US banks continue to fail, and there will be further tightening in credit, and consumers and businesses will be more defensive in spending, and the economy economy will then continue to contract again and again and then we'll go into a technical recession again for god knows how long because of two consecutive quarters of negative GDP and somehow inflation dies down because of that and that allows the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates sooner than later and you know, lo and behold, we see the light at the end of the tunnel again. And there goes the next bull run. Of course, that's the optimistic way of looking at things which really still involves pain regardless because before we even go into the actual technical recession you best be sure that the stock market is going to price that in advance and i think the better question to ask now is when is the recession and how long will the recession last honestly i don't know and no one knows either but if you die die want me to spot out a time frame for you maybe just maybe in the next six months because the fed is sort of expected to in cut interest rates at the end of 2023 or early 2024. So I'm just guessing before that's going to happen, the market should be in a lot of pain or rates to say the least. But of course, all of these are just theory crafting and I'm just piecing the puzzle based on what happened historically and what I see. And it will definitely be more complicated and unexpected than what I'm describing to you here. But my point here is the market will change faster than you can react. It's nearly impossible to catch the bottom and it sure was hard to know when was the top two back in say 2021. That's just how the way market works and it feels euphoric at the top and it also feels bad at the bottom and for what it's worth everyone feels sort of bad right now if you can agree with me i don't know maybe you can let me know in the comment section down below what you think in the meantime i will keep a close eye on the jobs report the purchasing managers index pmi report as well as the cpi and pce numbers and in parallel i'm again sound like a broken record i'm just going to dollar cost average invest as usual but more importantly have enough cash reserve stash aside for what's to come because it's going to be the ride of a lifetime and i sure don't want to miss out on the next bull run which again could be a complete annihilation as well 
Just saying, there's always the risk of that happening, right? Okay, thanks for watching, and as usual, I will see you in the next one.